workshop coming from the Best Bits gathering. Now, Best Bits is a relatively new civil society coalition uh, that met on the two days prior to or, uh, day zero, that is, on the, the last uh, um, on, fr on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we um, came together to uh, make some uh, tangible outputs that we could agree between ourselves as a civil society coalition that would assist in the current internet governance debates. So we discussed surveillance and privacy issues. We discussed the nature of multi-stakeholderism um, and principles that guide, should guide multi-stakeholderism. Uh, we discussed WISIS plus 10 process, the ITU. Um, we uh, discussed the enhanced cooperation process and of course the IGF itself and possible improvements to the IGF. And uh, whilst we don't have a, uh, we're, we're still finalizing some of the outputs from those meetings because the discussions that we began at those meetings are ongoing. Um, but one of the outputs that we were able to reach was um, a set of four principles uh, that we think should guide um, the upcoming uh, Brazil uh, uh, summit that was uh, scheduled for next year, 2014. So I'll come to that in a moment, uh, and we can use those principles as one of the um, discussion points before, for this workshop. But before I go into that, um, I'll just briefly uh, let you know who is on the panel. Uh, we have uh, on the far right, uh, Małgorzata Steiner from Poland. Uh, she has, uh, has uh, joined the, the panel to give a uh, perspective from the government of Poland on multi-stakeholderism. Uh, we have Ellen Blackner from um, Disney um, Worldwide Services and uh, myself, Jeremy Malcolm from Consumers International. Uh, then we have Ambassador Alexandre Fontenelle from Brazil. Oh, Benedict. Oh, I, sorry, we have a replacement. Uh, can you write your name for me, please? I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. And uh, on the uh, left of him, we have Paminder Jit Singh from IT for Change, an Indian-based uh, Civil Society Organization. Uh, Benedicto Fonsec, I'm sorry. Uh, and then on the far left, we have uh, Grace Gisaga from uh, Kenya. Oh, and, and finally, we have uh, Nigel Hickson from ICANN. So thank you very much, Nigel. And uh, we understand that everyone is rushing around uh, for, for meetings during lunch hours and everything. It's been a very busy IGF indeed. So um, we fully appreciate um, your attendance here in such a busy time. So um, the debates about internet governance have, uh, have come to a, to a head this year. And uh, for the first time, I think, since the, the WISP itself, we can feel real change in the air. Um, there has never been a time that I can remember since then um, that there's been such a palpable movement for change to the existing internet governance arrangement. Um, the uh, fundamental underlying principles that were established at Tunis, though, um, are still uh, very important to all of us, most notably the need for the involvement of all stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder process. Um, but the question of how to operationalize that is a very contested one. Of course, uh, one of the two, the two outputs of the with this summit um, that relate to internet governance were the formation of the IGF itself and the uh, mandate to commence a process of enhanced cooperation on internet related public policy issues. And uh, while the IGF was established straight away, um, there was a much greater confusion over how to take forward this mandate for enhanced cooperation. Um, so despite several inquiries and, uh, and, and public consultations, we still don't have a tangible um, manifestation of that process. Some would say there doesn't need to be a tangible manifestation. It's simply enough that the stakeholders are cooperating more um, independently of their own volition and we don't need to have 
a coordinating framework or process. But others disagree and say that uh, without some uh, kind of more tangible process to guide the cooperation of stakeholders, we won't actually be able to um, descend from the generalities that we're discussing at the IGF into uh, more tangible policy principles that can feed directly into decision making fora and other levels. So this is the this is the contested question that has come to a head this year in a number of different um, fora that uh, have um, come together at roughly the same time. So we have the working group on enhanced cooperation, and uh, we have a number of members of the working group on enhanced cooperation on this panel. It is, of course, the working group of the CSTD, the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, um, which is tasked with looking at um, the implementation of the enhanced cooperation mandate and making recommendations about how it can be, uh, the extent to which it's already been fulfilled and what else is needed to fulfill this mandate. So uh, it will be very interesting to hear from the panelists who, who are on the working group who can uh, give us an update on that. Um, but meanwhile, of course, we also have had the very unexpected announcement, uh, and certainly welcome in some quarters, but giving rise to great fear in other quarters, um, about a new internet, originally we were called an internet governance summit, now we're hearing that it's an internet governance conference or meeting um, to be held in Brazil. Uh, it now appears in May 2014. And, uh, I've just come, as have a number of you here, I've just come from a meeting um, with uh, ICANN's President and CEO, Fadi Chahade, who's uh, tried to give us some more clarity about what this process is, how he expects that, uh, uh, from his perspective as, as ICANN, who uh, is, is one of the stakeholders involved, how does he see civil society and the other stakeholder groups coming together to help organize the summit? conjunction with the government of Brazil and other governments. So, um, so how does this relate to the enhanced cooperation, the working group on enhanced cooperation? Is it overlapping? Is it uh, supporting? How does it relate to the IGF? We've heard strong statements of support from both Brazil and ICANN for the continuation of the IGF, but uh, um, in, in, in real terms, is the IGF going to be able to um, take forward the recommendations that the summit may come up with, or are we going to need new structures or processes? So it's a very confusing time for everyone. Uh, nobody knows exactly how this is all going to pan out, and the next 12 months are going to be extremely interesting. Um, but the goal that we all have is the same. We have, um, at the moment, a system of internet governance that is broken in many ways. Um, it's worked well uh, for for technical um, coordination in the main, but in terms of uh, human rights and, uh, and broader public policy issues, there has been a number of serious deficits, both in the coordination of the overlapping rules from many different countries, um, and in respect uh, by countries for the human rights of users who are not their own citizens. And uh, of course, I don't need to tell you that the um, the most current example of that is the NSA surveillance scandal and the scandal around similar surveillance programs from other countries. So, um, with that uh, context, let me uh, open up to our panellists to take their view about what they would do, uh, what they think is the, the way forward. How do we realign the roles of stakeholders in internet governance to fulfil the um, enhanced cooperation mandate. How do we um, do that in a way that all of the stakeholders can accept? The, the uh, um, technical community, which is very fixated on not having uh, too much government control. The government, some of whom are worried about giving up too much control. And civil society, which sometimes views itself as the weakest party of those groups, uh, and also including the private sector civil society often feels that it is the most marginalised stakeholder group. So um, the agenda for today is to focus on a number of key questions. Where, where are the existing internet governance arrangements failing? And whom are they failing the most? 
Is effective multi-stakeholder policy making possible where issues are fiercely contested? Can the IGF evolve and be strengthened? And what improvements could be made to these arrangements without setting the scene for an intergovernmental takeover of the internet? So uh, a very interesting uh, um, uh, topic for us all to discuss. And um, I have the, I'm going to follow the, the speaking order that's rather random, um, but I'm going to begin with, if it's okay with by him, Nigel Hickson from ICANN. Would you like to begin? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I didn't think I was first, but uh, anyway, uh, it's random enough, I suppose. Uh, well, good good afternoon. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much for in inviting us onto uh, onto this uh, onto this panel. Sorry, I'll speak a bit uh, clearer. Uh, some of you might have been in the uh, previous session, but uh, uh, many of you uh, will not have been. Uh, but you will have been in sessions this week where you've heard a number of issues being discussed uh, concerning something called the Monte, Montevideo Statement and issues concerning uh, the prospect of a, a conference in, uh, in, in, in Brazil or a meeting or a, a conclave or, or, or one of a number of other uh, uh, descriptors. Uh, and I'm quite happy to say something about that. But I think really first to address, uh, uh, from an ICANN perspective, the, the overall issue about internet governance, is it, is it broken? Uh, what's the future? Uh, and I'll, I'll try and confine myself to a uh, to a few issues. First of all, I don't think it's it, it, it's broken as, as such. I mean, there are clearly challenges, and the, the Tunis Agenda is, if you like, one of those challenges. The Tunis Agenda was written in a different time. The Tunis Agenda was written by civil servants like myself. I was in the UK government at the time. It was written. In a, in, a, in a fairly protracted, sorry, it's written in a, in a fairly compressed uh, uh, time scale, and it reflected the, the thinking of, of the time. It was a document which, of course, had compromises in, as all international documents tend to have compromises in, but it set out a very important agenda. And Jeremy referred to it in terms of uh, uh, supporting the uh, a multi-stakeholder approach, which was equal. But of course, it also had the, the concept of enhanced cooperation, which has uh, been brought up. And that is, of course, being uh, discussed in the CSTD. There's a, a working party that's considering enhanced cooperation in some detail. And indeed, lots of submissions have been made. And uh, on the CSTD site, I think in, in, a, in the very near future, there'll be a summary of all the contributions that governments and other bodies have made on enhanced cooperation. So that's going to be something very important indeed. But to go back to this question just briefly then, is it is it broken? Because I think this brings in this brings in the other aspect. And what Fadi Shahadi has been saying, and I think what several of us have been saying, whether we're in ICANN or other other institutions, is is that the wicked and some of you will have been at the wicket. Who was at the wicket in December? Who survived the by? There are, you see, some of you survived. A lot of people obviously didn't survive Dubai, and that's why they're not here. But uh, Dubai was a, was a wake-up call, I think, for many of us in the internet government space. Because there clearly was a division. The, the conference clearly didn't come to, wasn't a success. I mean, you can call it a failure, but it certainly wasn't a, what certainly wasn't a success. And what it showed is that there is a considerable gap. There's a considerable gap in the ability to discuss issues concerning internet governance. Many discussions took place in Dubai on issues such as cyber security or privacy or various other issues. And some governments said, well, this isn't an issue for the ITU. This isn't an issue to be discussed here. We don't want to discuss cyber security here. We don't want to discuss spam here. We don't want to discuss some of the other wider internet governance issues. That, that, that's not for the ITU. And some governments legitimately said, well, where do we discuss those issues? Where can we have a fora to discuss those issues? Where can we as the government of whatever country learn from other governments 
about how they've tackled these public policy issues. So there was, to an extent, this, uh, this gap, this lacuna, if you like. And this, I think, is some of the thinking that's coming out in terms of how we take the process forward. Because the ITU, as you know, was having a plenipotentiary in uh, 2014 in, 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 in Korea, where some of these issues will no doubt come on the agenda again. And therefore, there is this question of before that happens, and before we discuss the issues in, in, in Busan in 2014, is there a, should we discuss at least in this multi-stakeholder community whether a, a new process, or whether some new dialogue is needed? And that's the genesis of some of the discussion. So I think all I'll, all I'll briefly conclude Okay, Jeremy. It's just what what's taken place over the last uh, couple of days. It's uh, and perhaps we can obviously return we can return uh, to this. Uh, Fadi Chahadi, as, as many of you know, he spoke in the uh, he spoke in the opening of the uh, opening of the IGF and he's spoken uh, in, in several other meetings. He met the president of, uh, of, of Brazil. Uh, this wasn't a long planned meeting. I, I, I know that much. It, it took place in, in, in quite a hurry, but it was an opportunity for him to meet the president of, of Brazil. And the president of Brazil, as you, as you well know, had uh, addressed the UN General Assembly a few weeks back, uh, where she had noted that there were significant problems, not least because of the Snowden re uh, revelation, and had called for a new framework, a new multilateral framework for internet governance issues. Now, this, this of course, is something that you know, many of us feel is the wrong way forward. Other people might feel it's the only way forward to have a, a purely governmental approach. But for, for many of us, having a purely governmental approach is, is, is the wrong way. It, it's simply the wrong way forward for many reasons, which, of course, we're not here to discuss today. But obviously, we felt that when we drafted the Tunis agenda, otherwise we wouldn't have spent those sleepless nights. So in this, in this meeting with the president of Brazil, the idea or some form of conference, some sort of process to discuss the whole area of internet governance in a multi-stakeholder setting, a multi -stakeholder, uh, setting was, was discussed between the President and Fadi Jihadi, and, and thus Fadi's ideas, along with many other people's, perhaps to have some sort of coalition, to have some sort of process whereby a conference in Brazil, perhaps in May uh, 2014, and discuss the future of internet governance in a, in a, in a wider context. And I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, next we have uh, Malgazada Steiner from Poland. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that was a very good and useful summary of recent events that we all know and that sort of build a context for this conversation. Um, and I think I would add to that um, what our Polish perspective was on those, all those, on those recent events. Um, and this is because, uh, not because I assume that we are all very interested in uh, the details of Polish uh, internet uh, governance questions or Polish approaches, but because I think we are in many ways representative for, uh, representative for what other countries are going through or need to go through in order to really um, um, to really adapt the multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and um, for us, this history begins a little bit sooner, and it begins uh, around internet governance question, and it begins with ACTA protests, which were really a huge turning point for Poland, uh, because you might, you might know that we, had, uh, we were the first country to have a huge protest, and we had millions of people in the streets, uh, in the capital city and in smaller towns, uh, and this was actually the biggest protest movement since the 80s. Um, we already had like a thesis among polit political scientists in Poland that Polish society doesn't protest. We never go to the streets. And then ACTA came and immediately we had protests on a scale similar to the, to the 80s, so to the uh, moment where Poland became, uh, where Poland was transitioned from communist to democracy. Yeah? And that's a really, uh, that was a big wake up call for everyone. Um, that we thought, okay, there is some uh, missing links between uh, different stakeholders around the internet governance. And we had like the first thing for us to do was to organize uh, 
big multi-stakeholder meeting. We didn't call it multi-stakeholder at that time. Uh, but we actually invited uh, users who were protesting in the streets. We invited artists, we invited um, businesses, we invited technical people um, to have a big conversation with the Prime Minister. And it was an eight-hour con conversation without break. I sat through it and I couldn't go to the toilet even. So it was a, um, an experience, I can tell you. Um, and the first reactions were, were that people were, didn't even see the need for conversation. So everyone wanted an authoritative decision from the Prime Minister. Uh, and they were clear that the only solution is uh, for the uh, Prime Minister either to withdraw the signature uh, uh, for ACTA or to sign ACTA. Uh, but certainly like what people across the uh, stakeholder factions were agreeing on is that there, there needs to be an authoritative decision by the Prime Minister uh, who will tell us what to do. And of course, one, uh, one group thought he needs to tell us that we need to sign, and the other group thought that he needs to tell us that we are not going to sign. Uh, and that's the beginning of a dialogue. It's a hard beginning, um, and it took us a while to make it into a, a process where really the different factions were able to talk to each other and to listen to each other and to learn from each other. And that was what we practiced since, uh, since that time. Uh, and we organized like two, two, two congresses, two big meetings uh, for those all parties engaged. Uh, we had workshop groups that worked on topics that were relevant to, uh, to internet at that time. And that was a workshop on privacy. There was a workshop on copyright, a workshop on, on, on how we run consultations around internet dialogue. And, and those workshops were to give us proposals on how to go along with dialogue. But it was a new approach, and it really took some, um, some adjustments, both for the government, from the businesses, and from the users. And at first, it might sound weird, but as we invited like, business people to talk about uh, business models, different business models, uh, that, uh, and what they need to implement business models in the internet, um, they would sit there and they would be like, you know, why should we talk with these companies? Uh, we are competitors. So what are the common interests that we have that we can bring to the table? Why do you put us in one room at all? So even it was hard for us to organize a discussion between business people. And of course, they discussed with each other in, uh, in like different represent uh, trade representations and so on. Uh, but I think that like, the difference was that this time we needed like a real, um, so we needed people who on a daily basis deal with business and not people who on a daily uh, basis deal with public policy issues. Yeah? And to get those people into one room and to get them to discuss, uh, it took us a while. And another consequence, because that is uh, sort of a consequence, this dialogue process, the consequence of uh, on our internal politics, and we still like continue this dialogue, and that's like so now we would never think of a regulation uh, that touches the internet that wouldn't be discussed with everyone until everyone is really tired of discussing, because we learned our lesson, yeah, and we exhaust people <laughs> with discussing, but we think there is no other way. Um, but in terms of our international involvement, what has changed? Um, is that, for example, in preparation of Dubai, so we all knew, of course, that ICRs are, are going to be discussed and that it's a, a key topic, a, a crucial topic, and that it could be a turning point. Um, and we had a little trouble because uh, we, um, well, it wasn't a custom uh, till then that you would um, release uh, the documents uh, before they are negotiated in those conferences. And we knew that after ACTA, this is not the thing we want to do not the thing we can do. So another document that won't be consulted with, uh, with civil society before it will be adopted. So what we actually did, uh, we, uh, we allowed the public consultation of the document and we put it on our website and nothing happened. Yeah? So then like ICU also put the document on its website uh, and I think we all benefited from it. Yeah? And it, it was really, I think, I cannot imagine Dubai with documents being kept secret. That would have been, uh, well, I'm not sure who would survive. Uh, uh, such a such a such a conference there, yeah. um, so and and we had an open consultation process on ICRs. It was very helpful and it allowed us to to feel uh, to feel where the possible uh, problems arise. Uh, and actually, when we went to Dubai because of that, we had a stronger mandate as a government because we knew what civil society is about on these issues. We knew what business thinks on these issues, uh, and it helped us to prepare much better for it. And as we were in Dubai, 
Uh, so my colleague Martin, who sits there, uh, was in Dubai, for example, and we had a big delegation in Dubai. But we also had a delegation um, in Poland, uh, and I was uh, doing that work, um, who was in charge of keeping our sales stakeholders uh, informed about what is going on in Dubai. And that was really a 24-7 job. Uh, because uh, some of them, of course, couldn't, civil society especially, couldn't go to buy for, for, for financial reasons, but it was our job to, to, make, to keep them informed enough and to uh, keep them up to date on what is going on so that they won't become suspicious about uh, what is happening or that some issues are going to be out of control. And I guess that um, what, what was also the consequence of so so. Um, as you know, like in this conference in, uh, in, in Geneva in May, ITU also tried like a new, a new approaches to involving, uh, to, to, like trying to apply a more multi-stakeholder method of, of working. Yeah. And we think it was as a first step, it worked okay. And, and that is why Poland also uh, made a written contribu contribution afterwards for ITU to encourage it to, uh, to, keep, to continue with this process. And this is not, of course, because, so we still think, you know, there is, there will be always an important role for ITU in telecommunications questions, not that much in internet questions, we believe, but telecommunications and internet are connected. So we won't get rid of this uh, problem and these issues. And the only thing we can do is, yes, improve our multi-stakeholder body um, that we are talking about, but on the other hand, uh, try to uh, help ITU evolve in a way that is also more, more multi-stakeholder. And we all know that it's not the pro problem that the main systemic problem is not with, uh, with ITU as an organization, uh, but with the fact that it's a membership driven organization. Yeah, and the, as long as we have different members, different approaches to policy making, um, as long as we will have difficulties with, with installing to full extent like those kind of processes. And I hope that this example of, uh, that this example of Poland that I described in quite a detail uh, will show you what difficulties I'm talking about. So even in a like, fully democratic society that is used to quite a bit of dialogue, it was really not easy to implement what we call multi-stakeholder uh, on the ground. Yeah? So that's a long process. Um, and uh, well, we are all practicing it with IGF and with other bodies all the time. And ITU also needs to practice that. Um, and the tool next year will be crucial because we have a number of reviews, number of initiatives on the table. So it shows that the time is right for some new steps, and, uh, and they will be taken step by step, but I'm sure that they will be taken. Thank you very much indeed. That's extremely interesting about the um, activities in Poland. It set the ground for multi-stakeholders and that. So uh, I'm going to actually skip across um, to the other end of the table now, uh, because I'm trying to um, balance out the civil society and the government speakers. Uh, with a, a civil society speaker now. Um, so, uh, Paminder Jeet Singh from IT for Change. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. You have really laid out a slate of some very difficult questions which cannot possibly be addressed in such a short time. But I think I'll, I'll, I'll step back a little. Um, the governance issue, why does the governance issue arise in a particular now, if I ask you guys, what does the internet do? You'll be completely taken aback and ask me what kind of question is it? It does practically everything and so many different things. So the problem is that internet is so many different things. Its governance is seen by a lot of different people from many different sides. And they stick to their vision of it and they seem to be in conflict with the other vision when they probably are talking about different things. And I think we now need to start understanding that fact. And on another axis, there is an issue of maintenance issues about the internet and political issues about the internet. And I'll try to give an example. If we all have to kind of live or set up office space in this room, and we find that room is leaking from two or three spaces, and we don't know where our office is would be allocated finally, that's a technical problem for us. We all agree what needs to be done, and all of us want to do it in the same manner. The only thing left is how to do it, and that's a technical question. We would agree, and that kind of thing can be decided on consensus, because everybody is giving expertise, and everybody has the same interest in mind, and there are no power conflicts, etc., etc. And that's about the maintenance of the internet, the technical issues about the internet. 
largely the domain name registration issues and all those kind of things. And that requires kind of a very collaborative process where everybody's expert is counts. Whoever knows more should contribute more and those kind of things which we need to be associated with icon like processes. However, if we have to start deciding who will live in which part of the room or occupy offices in which part of the room and how big would be that office and the total space is limited, then we have issues of what would be a political issue. There are conflicts of interest which have to be managed in a different kind of processes. And that's what is public policy about. And it cannot be decided in the same consensual way in which technical issues get decided. And I think therefore, before we go to the governance issue of the internet, we need to agree on the problem. We all agree that it needs good maintenance and that's why we have the technical maintenance organizations. But perhaps many of us do not see another side of a problem or a challenge. Internet is an artifact that redistributes political, social, economic, cultural powers in many, many huge manners. Internet has reorganized global business. It has concentrated economic power in some ways, some forms. It has decentralized it over other places. It has changed political power in many countries. It's changing geopolitical powers. Cultural issues are huge. The homogenization of cultural content can be huge. In other places, it's giving rise to plurality of content. So these are political issues, and these issues cannot be decided in the same manner in which we decide technical issues, because they are conflicted. And the fact that they need to be decided in some way or the other is more important to the people who are on the receiving side of, you know, the wrong side of the power equation. And if we insist in consensus, which could mean a paralysis in many situations, then you stick to the status quo, which goes in favor of certain, certain, certain people. And as I was commenting in another session that I saw that the Lincoln movie, whose name I have forgotten, but the movie was good, and I saw that processes in the Congress of the US, and we all know here that if we had insisted on a consensus, slavery would never have got abolished. And that was a big thing because it got abolished and many, many such things have happened which are of political nature. We require political processes around them. So I think we need to separate the technical maintenance part of the, the internet governance and the public policy part. Now, I come to the question of multi-stakeholders, which is the second question of Jeremy's list. And I don't think I'll be able to reach the end of the list though. Uh, I would support multi-stakeholderism if I knew what it is. I was very impressed with the Polish experience and it shows us how people can exert pressure and make political claims and how put the fear of God in the minds of the governments who change their processes. Therefore, we have always called it participatory democracy. It's hugely evolved, for example, in Brazil, in parts of India, but yes, many other countries. And I have asked people, how is multi-stakeholderism different from participatory democracy? And I see multi-stakeholderism as a sophisticated kind of a sustained mechanism of engagement. And that's what they did. They listened to them, they went to Wicked, they still were informing them. That's a beautiful platform of engagement. Not like the earlier times that governments they are chosen and they'll decide what I want. They need to be engaged and it should be sustained, it should be meaningful, real. That's what multi-stakeholderism is in public policy making. But when you come to decision-making powers, that's, that's a very tricky thing. Decision-making in public policy involves invoking coercive powers which lies with the state, which actually impacts people's interests. We cannot allow, let's say, some companies who may be against certain privacy uh, guidelines to permanently block a privacy guidelines framework. Similarly about taxation issues, e-commerce issues, uh, vertical integration, competition law, these cannot be decided in a multi-stakeholder manner, decided, not uh, the engagement process which, which is important. I think these distinctions need to be made and public policy is a process which requires a different kind of in, uh, decision-making framework altogether from what are known as the technical processes. 
Yes, the IGF should be strengthened. There was a proposal by India in the working group on IGF improvement, which was very exhaustive how it should be strengthened. Some part of it has been retained in the final process. And yes, I think I uh, and our organization considers IGF as version three of democracy. And let me take a minute on that. Version one was that governments get elected and they say, okay, we are there now and we'll take policy decisions. If you don't like it, wait for the elections and decide your new representatives. And slowly we started to have consultative processes which have been happening in many countries. But it was ad hoc. A government will suddenly call a certain set of people and have a committee and talk something, but on their own terms. And whenever they like it. But there's some kind of consultation going on. And I think IGF is an institutionalization, a kind of a permanent consultative mechanism around issues on a certain subject which is ongoing and takes place a little autonomous of public policy making. So that's an excellent engagement framework and that's IGF and it should be strengthened in that role but still decision making is a tricky issue and should be left to people who really are accountable and can exercise that kind of uh, political power. What improvements should be made to the arrangements without setting scene for intergovernmental takeover of the internet? There's a bit of a discourse hegemon here. We in Hyderabad IGF distributed pamphlets which talk about corporatization, corporatization of the internet. The chair said we shouldn't use these kinds of terms which make some stakeholders unhappy. But we have regularly seen the use of the term governmental over, taking over of the internet. So I think, yes, nobody wants statist controls over the internet. Uh, but Legitimate public policy roles of the government have to be recognized, but they should take place in a very, very clear framework of multi-stakeholder engagement. And once we agree to those principles, we can, I think, make a lot of progress on improving the global governance of the internet. Where there's a lot of meeting of mind everywhere that something needs to be done. And I think if we agree on those principles. There's a lot, you know, a lot of hope that we can move forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paminda. And so uh, if I can uh, then move the other direction of the panel again, Ellen Blackman. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Blackman with Disney. Not on, is it on? Okay. Um, uh, I thought I could talk a little bit about the Enhanced Cooperation Working Group. Uh, if that is as a CSPD. I am on the as a commenter. Um, it's, I view it really as um, you know, part of the mix here, we are uh, responding to the mandate from the UN General Assembly who asked the CFPD to put together a working group and explore what needed to be done to further advance enhanced cooperation. We've had our first meeting a few months ago, and at that meeting, the, the working group itself was made up of representatives from the business community, from civil society and from government. So there's about 40 of us all together. And at the first meeting, we spent some time talking about what enhanced cooperation meant or should mean or could mean. And we spent a lot of time talking about that. And we ultimately worked up a questionnaire that I hope many of you responded to that outlined some questions for getting input on what enhanced cooperation meant, what the opportunities for further cooperation were, and really started to get at the question of what are the issues that are uh, not being addressed where we need to do a better job of finding a place to address them. So we are analyzing those answers now and we are actually having our meeting the week after next, November 5th or 6th or something like that, where we'll begin to answer, look at those answers and figure out what we can learn from the input. So I, I just want to address for a second kind of this bigger question about internet governance. I think one of the things that is always interesting to me is we sometimes, I guess even the question says, you know, is it broken or failing? I think, I don't think it's helpful to talk about it that way. I think we have to keep in mind that like any process, it can always be improved and that one of the things here that is really so interesting is that we're inventing something new. And this is why it's really hard. And it's really hard because we're doing two things. Not only are we inventing something new, literally that has never been done before, we're taking um, functions that had traditionally or 
in society, we traditionally deal with these things through our governments, and we're saying we think we need something new in the internet that is more multi-stakeholder and brings in all these other points of view into the decision making. So this is new. In the past, we had focused on uh, improving openness and transparency in the governmental processes, and we can continue to focus on that. And I think uh, Margot talked about some great examples of how governments are working to improve openness and transparency. But really, in the internet space, when we talk about multi-stakeholder, we're talking about inventing something brand new. And this is why we don't quite always know how to do it. And at the same time, we're addressing some problems that are really hard. And these are the same problems that exist offline that we haven't solved. When you think about uh, things like expression, there are all kinds of freedom of expression problems that have nothing to do with the internet. Governments have a range of view about how to deal with them. And people are oppressed in many ways offline. And so we're doing two things at once. We're taking really hard problems, and we're inventing new ways to solve them. And that's why I think it sometimes seems confusing and seems like things are failing, but we have to remember that we're inventing something from scratch. And that it's all part of a process that will get us to uh, you know, a better place. And it's, I think it's helpful not to think of any one event or any one forum or any one meeting as the answer. And it's really part of a panoply of um, solutions. And, and one thing that always strikes me about coming to the IDF is how many people are engaged and how many people are putting in resources of time and money and their brains. And it seems like if, if we keep focused on that and that all these different kind of suggestions on the table, whether it's you know, a meeting in Brazil or the Enhanced Cooperation Work Group or the IGF itself, uh, you know, no one thing is going to get us there, but if we're all in the mix, kind of going in the right direction, it seems like that's kind of a perspective, an important perspective. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so before we move on to um, our next panelist, I'm going to take a little break and um, tell you the principles that we agreed at the Best Bits meeting. Um, and this is sort of a work in progress because um, we're also planning to issue a more detailed statement uh, of our views um, about the upcoming uh, summit or meeting in Brazil. Um, but this is sort of an interim step along the way. Um, so these principles may uh, be tweaked a little. Um, in fact, they've already been tweaked a little, but um, the version that we, uh, the working version that we reached agreement on at the meeting was on these basic principles that should guide the development of the planned summit on internet governance. So first we uh, thought that the event should discuss what internet governance architecture is required to support an inclusive, people-centric, development-oriented information society. We believe that this requires at the very minimum that such a structure is democratic, that it should be inclusive of all countries and all stakeholders, and that it protects and promotes human rights. Second, we, uh, we said that the full participation of civil society stakeholders in planning and in the meeting should be guaranteed and resourced. Third, we said a strengthened internet governance forum could play a role in the future internet governance arrangements to be discussed at the event and it should be linked with the CSGD working group on enhanced cooperation process as appropriate. And fourth, we said the event should extend beyond speeches and presentations, and modalities should be developed to allow all stakeholders, including remote participants, to participate on an equal footing. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn to um, our panelist, uh, Ambassador Benedicto from Brazil, um, to tell us a little more. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And uh, I'd like to start by providing some context for the decision that was made regarding the summit we intend to convene in Brazil. For the moment being, it was spelled uh, out by our president of the summit, so I'd like to retain for the moment this uh, notion. Uh, first of all, as it was stated before, uh, the speech that was delivered by President Dilma at the opening of the general debate of the General Assembly. Uh, she made reference to the uh, idea that Brazil would promote uh, 
civil framework, international civil framework. And uh, it's important to bear in mind that her speech was very much inspired uh, by what we are doing internally. Indeed, uh, the members of the Brazilian Steering Committee, which is, of course, a global stakeholder body that uh, oversees the Internet in Brazil uh, and is responsible for the management of .br, met with President Dilma a week before her speech at the UN Assembly. And if you compare the principles she spelled out and the principles that were developed in Brazil in a multi-stakeholder environment, in, within CGI you will see a lot of, uh, of similarities. It's not a coincidence. So uh, it is, I would say it is not accurate to see say that what President Dilma was proposing was something to be done at a purely multilateral uh, setting in the international community. And here I refer to uh, something that was discussed in previous uh, events in, China, in this uh, IGF, which refers to the, the issue of language, of context, that sometimes are used by different stakeholders conveying different meanings and leading to different interpretations. Uh, uh, since this uh, President Dilma's speech was clearly inspired by the Brazilian experience that they have a 20-year experience of dealing with internet issues in a multi-stakeholder format. And she expressly indicated, that even at the UN, that the government did not intend to do it separately, that civil society and the other stakeholders should be involved. So the use of the word much later in that context uh, not be seen as something excluded. Uh, I, I want to be very specific about that because otherwise that might lead to misleading interpretation that there was an intent at the opening of the end and that intent changes because uh, President Dilma was shown the light by a few parties and then she found out that that idea was wrong, that this is not the case. I want to be very clear about that. I think if we are forging a partnership and we want to forge a partnership, uh, some assumptions should be very, made very clear so we have a respectful uh, relationship towards each other. We, as a government, want to be very respectful of civil society, of private sector, of all stakeholders, and we expect the same treatment. Uh, by the way, uh, after this speech, President Dilma, extensive consultations were held by our Ministry of the Government that were there in New York, and we received overwhelming sentiment of support for uh, the notions that was, were expressed by, by her in her speech. And this encouraged us in, in seeing that we were reflecting in a way, let's say, the sentiment of the community of states there. Later on, as you all know, the Montevideo Declaration that was issued by a number of ISAR, what was one of the ISAR entity from the technical community also clearly indicated the willingness and the sentiment that changes should be made regarding uh, the status quo, the, the way we have been doing things, international cooperation, I think there is, the, the language was used in that regard, that international cooperation should be received. Uh, and there was a particular reference to, to ICANN, uh, and uh, I do not want to dwell too much on this because I think sometimes the debate on internet governance is too much centered around ICANN or ITU and we lose maybe sight of so many other important dimensions. But there was a reference to ICANN in the De Montevideo Declaration. And it is also very important to, to indicate that after that, the president and CEO of ICANN met with President Dilma, as, as it was said, it was not an expected meeting, but he met with her. And uh, he himself endorsed what was already in the Montevideo Declaration. And President Dilma was very encouraged by this, that even the technical community, including ICON, would be prepared to look into the international architecture and to see what, what adjustments are, are made. So, I think the, the basic assumption that we are working within the context of the Tunis agenda, of the outcome, we, we are not 
aim at dramatic change, but we want to make sure any appropriate adjustment is made. And this was conveyed by the President of ICANN himself, so we could only agree that would be the case. And I don't think that the study was aiming at changing some functions from ICANN and moving to ICU. I don't think that was his intent. But anyway, he said that he thinks he concurs with the view that some changes are, have to be made. So I think sometimes we might be far from this idea that if we are any criticism that we make uh, implies a certain, certain direction, things are much more complex than that. And we are encouraged that the president of ICANN himself is concurred with that vision. Uh, therefore, the meaning of our presence here and our Minister of Communication came to this meeting for the first time a Minister of State of Brazil come to the NICHF meeting outside Brazil. We held uh, in, uh, the second edition in Brazil and of course there were ministers there, but outside the first time. And the meaning of him coming here is to hold extensive consultations with other stakeholders. And then I repeat, we have an overwhelming sentiment on the part of government also the expression from technical community. So the intent of coming here is to reach out to the other sectors and to say we are ready to work with you. We want to uh, construct collectively the, the, the agenda and, the, and work towards an outcome uh, of this meeting in Brazil that would come up with something uh, that would be a contribution to the process. And it is important to say that we want to be respectful of the existing processes, uh, particularly the one that directly refers to the theme of this panel, enhanced cooperation. Enhanced cooperation is a process that Brazil uh, and others, we have been very uh, keen about that and, and pushing for that for a number of years. So now that we have process in that direction, we want to make sure it's can yield the, the, the most productive outcome. So we do not want in any way that this event in Brazil would harm in no way uh, enhanced cooperation. And also the process has been led by ITU and the other agencies regarding the review of action lines and that will converge to this uh, meeting either in Charmichet or what I've heard in some other place. I think the first quarter of April, we also want to be very respectful of that. And we see that our events can provide for input and a way forward uh, that could be, let's say, further energize the process. And of course, we want to be very respectful of IGF. We do not see any way our events competing or, or superseding IGF. We aim at a one time event with a particular focus, which is yet to be completely defined as per the consultations that are being held. Uh, but we do not aim to have, to initiate a process that will have the, the, the scope and the continuity that IGF conveys. And although we have, we are now finishing the second cycle of IGF, we see IGF as a permanent uh, body. We, we don't see uh, an alternative as we look into the architecture of the internet of any alternative to, to IGF. And in this Brazil, it's, it's candidate to host the 2015 edition of IGF. And this is a very clear statement of our commitment to this process. And the fact that our minister came here to consult and the event in Brazil is not finalized. We do not have yet the complete outline exactly because President Dilma said she wants that it to be uh, built, constructed, collectively, and fully reflect uh, multi stakeholder, multi stakeholder dimension. So this is uh, maybe I should uh, stop here, but just to reinforce and reiterate our willingness to work with all parties as a method that we have been uh, imparting that we want to, we have a challenge of, of time, the time frame for organizing and make it happen very short. But we do not want at the same time to lose the political momentum, the momentum that has been generated uh, in the aftermath of the, the disclosure, uh, not to react, not to do something only that will be seen 
as a negative reaction to this, but to put in place, let's say, some new uh, ideas that will allow us for a framework that in similar situations we can, as a collectivity, as a community, uh, have mechanisms to address them. And this refers uh, directly to enhanced cooperation. Uh, in the aftermath of, of the disclosures, and we have been dealing with this uh, internally. We are taking steps internally to, to address situations. We are reinforcing our legal framework uh, regarding the protection of privacy and freedom of expression. This is part of our, uh, let's say, reaction, response to this. But it is not enough. We are doing also bilaterally. We have been in discussion with the United States, but we it does not belong here, of course. And regionally also, we are working with uh, in our region to address vulnerabilities, to work on infrastructure. So there are different levels of response. But at the multilateral level, what is important is that as uh, uh, a result of this, that we can collectively devise ways in which we can address existing gaps, existing the, 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 uh, the shortcomings in the sense that we could not find an appropriate way to channel the, and to follow up on what President Dilma proposed. How, what would be the appropriate place to follow up on this? So the Brazilian summit is a uh, proposal and we want to construct it with you. How can we maybe have aim at some kind of, uh, along the lines of proposal, some declaration, principles, norms, or any other that would be authoritative enough to, to do this issue. And on top of that, what related internet governance uh, issues, uh, aspects of, 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 of the operation of the system could also be dealt with either by providing some, some ideas or coming up with some rough consensus. The intent is to again, provide for some positive contribution that would be, in some cases, first incorporated in the existing process and be further digested within this process. So we want to play this catalyzer role, but we want to do it collectively. It's not a Brazilian proposal, not an ICANN proposal, it's something we want to do uh, in a collective uh, setting, and therefore the importance of IGF is important for the full participation of all stakeholders is very dear to us, and we want to reinforce the, the importance of this for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, extremely useful and informative. Um, and uh, it's very interesting seeing this uh, picture gain, gain clarity as, as we're hearing from, um, from the Brazilian representatives here. And um, still a lot of clarity still to come, I'm sure. Um, now, let's move on to the final panelists. And uh, on her behalf, I'd just uh, like to uh, uh, let you know that she's not feeling too well. So um, I hope that uh, this is not going to place too much stress for her to participate. So we really thank her for making the effort to be here, um, despite how she's feeling. Uh, Grace Githaga from Kenya, uh, can you, uh, I'll just uh, walk over with the microphone. I think that's easier. Uh, my name is Grace Githaga from the Kenya ICT Action Network, Excellent. Uh, um, we are basically a uh, multi-stakeholder group that looks into policy issues uh, and contributes that uh, whenever there, there is a need or raise issues that need policy or legislation uh, attention in Kenya. Uh, for those of you who may not know, um, Kenya is one of the countries that got involved very early, um, in the early stages of uh, IGN. So Kenya has had, um, I think this year we had our six uh, Kenya IGF, and uh, Kenya has always uh, participated in the global and regional IGF. Um, however, uh, there are certain changes, and I will be speaking to them uh, shortly. But I want to go to the uh, to the questions that uh, Jeremy had put to us. And uh, the first one is, you know, where the existing internet governance arrangement failed. And for us in Kenya, um, what has happened is that uh, since Wiki, there seems to, 
uh, some mistrust seems to have cropped up between stakeholders. And there is a feeling that uh, some stakeholders have been privileged more than others. And therefore, uh, their input uh, has been taken seriously. Uh, I have in mind the, the business community that also takes um, a large proportion of the technical community, and they seem to be wielding more influence than other stakeholders, and therefore their, you know, their influence is seen more in policy making. And that has actually started bringing that mistrust among uh, stakeholders. So, you know, there has been lack of reflection of certain um, stakeholders' input in whatever final outcome uh, that results, for example, uh, in wiki. Now, is effective multi stakeholder policy making possible where uh, issues are fiercely contested? And again, the example of wiki uh, still stands. And my answer uh, at the moment is, is no. And it's because, like I say, some stakeholders um, have carried the day. And, and because of this, we have been debating on the need to have uh, very clear frameworks that provide for input and output on an equal basis for all stakeholders whenever there is an issue of concern or wherever there is a policy uh, making process uh, that relates to internet. Um, now, um, one, one of the positive things that, uh, that has emerged from the Kenyan government is uh, Kenya has, uh, we are still calling it a new constitution, uh, but it was promulgated in, uh, in 2010, and in this one, uh, multi-stakeholderism has sort of been legitimized or uh, justified, uh, and is now enshrined in the constitution where there is a call to involve all stakeholders in a sector in any area of policy making processes. So that is there and stakeholders can demand to participate. However, the challenge remains of how this is uh, going to be implemented or implementation of involving all stakeholders. Because we know that uh, true multi-stakeholder can only be actualized if stakeholders or ordinary people um, embrace and push for participation and that their contribution is reflected in, uh, in final outcome. So that remains the challenge that we lack a clear framework on how uh, to incorporate uh, all stakeholders in this whole uh, policy making process, including the internet. Now how can IGF uh, uh, be strengthened? And from the Kenyan perspective, unfortunately, um, is that uh, there seems to be fatigue uh, around the IGF. And yet we know that the IGF is, is a very good space for bringing on board issues of concern um, that are debated very honestly and, um, and therefore uh, allow government also to do sometimes not very honestly, but at least there's that opportunity. So, um, but at least there's that opportunity. So, um, so um, the question we, you know, that, that that keeps cropping up is how do we then make IGF, um, you know, that perception that IGF is, is is a talk shop. How do we stop it from making it look like a talk shop, a talk shop? and offer practical lessons because the new uh, leadership uh, in the Ministry of ICT, you know, they are asking for practical uh, leadership. So if you're talking of affordable, um, you want affordable internet, you want affordable uh, broadband, they want you to offer practical uh, lessons. And maybe that is where we need to go back onto the drawing board. <clears throat> now, um, how can um, the suggestions that we are all making um, be taken forward? And um, just looking at uh, somebody, one of the speakers did speak about the enhanced cooperation and the fact that there was a questionnaire that people responded. Now, the Kenya uh, Civil Society responded to this questionnaire. And one of the things that emerged is that 
uh, then enhanced cooperation must listen and, and understand different points of views in terms of geographic and cultural diversity. And the civil society then uh, see the significance of enhanced cooperation as a place where the deliberations and outcomes of internet governance policy uh, will be arrived at consensus, uh, as a consensus and that all stakeholders will feel their input has been considered. Uh, they also feel that uh, enhanced cooperation will enable stakeholders to participate in international public policy issues, uh, again on an equal footing, and they see that happening through a multi-stakeholder model. Um, and I want to end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we check the other microphone? Because we'll probably need to use this for roaming for questions. This one is not open. Um, so let's open it to the floor. We have about 20 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, and so uh, who has... Oh, no, it's working now. Great, thank you. So who has uh, something they would like to ask or, or comment on? Yes, at the back. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't, shouldn't get you to do the <laughs> running around. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, wonderful workshop, and thank you for all the speakers. Uh, actually, I, I wanted to, uh, to say something about the references to uh, wickets, and it's very relevant, maybe. Uh, it, it's funny enough, from my own experience, I have been involved in ITU work for some time, especially the working group that worked actually uh, on preparation for Wicked for some time. And the, the notion I, I want to stress actually that the community and the internet community, the IGF community, some of them were aware of discussions about ITR. Uh, I, I recall seeing uh, Mr. Peter uh, Danabit Tersh, the ICANN, uh, I think, president at that time, uh, in the room uh, at one of the meetings of that working group. Uh, he was informally there and he was informed about the discussion. But it took the community too long to recognize that something is really happening as it is coming on the way. And uh, I, I didn't see much action by many stakeholders, including uh, government, in terms of making consultations, until the very last month before the conference in Dubai, which, make it, which made it very difficult for the conference in Dubai to actually conclude on a, on, on a more solid ground. And I think now we, we are in a similar position. We know that the current model is not perfect. Uh, I don't know if it's spoken or not, but it's definitely it's not perfect. There's something that could be done. Uh, there is another event happening uh, coming up in Saudi. And we keep discussing other issues related to it, whether it's multi-stakeholder or multilateral, what are the norms, what are the modalities. These are important things, but we, we need to keep our minds also focused on what to propose as those coming through. There's something happening and we should be prepared early on this time. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone on the panel want to comment? I mean, I'm sure we all agree with that, um, but does anyone have any specific comments? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you very much. I, I mean, just two, two brief points. I mean, yes, indeed. I, I, I think I, uh, we, we agree with you. I mean, uh, clearly, it did seem to be that there was a lack of understanding in the process leading up to the uh, wicket, which was uh, a reasonably open process. Lots of people were in, in involved in the, in the preparation of the ITR. But then the ITRs were labelled as the International Telecommunication Regulation. So, uh, so I suppose to some it was a surprise to see uh, proposals or changes to those ITRs that include maybe the US uh, and, and various other internet related issues. So, Perhaps that, that, that reflects some of it. I, I think as we move forward, uh, then, then, then clearly, and uh, uh, the Honourable Ambassador, I think, his, his very uh, wise and measured words uh, to, to us earlier. I, I, I think we should, uh, you know, we should take to heart and, and, and follow very carefully, because I mean, clearly, uh, Brazil are, uh, are, are entering into this uh, 
into this into this venture in a very open and a very pragmatic and a in, in a way which I, I, I think then hopefully will result in, a, in in an excellent discussion on on internet governance and I mean cl clearly you know what whatever our, what wherever we come from wherever whatever our views are uh, there does seem to be a, a real desire to, to to find perhaps better ways forward in, in, in certain areas on, on, on how we can deal with these uh, these very important issues to us Thank you. Uh, Pamina, do you want to? Uh, maybe you can respond briefly anyway, and then we'll go to this question. Yeah, we agree completely that the way you suddenly throw wicket at people that would uh, end in the kind of things which really happened there. And in that context, again, we seem to have developed a very big distrust of the UN processes. How many of you were at VISIS? Uh, did you participate in any of the VISIS processes? Now, VISIS process is the most consultative and participatory process I have seen. Not like ICANN, and I can tell you why it's not like ICANN, because dealing with real public policy issues, you have to be a little careful about capture. Over two years, text was developed, and there were civil society caucuses, there were disability caucuses, there were gender caucuses, there were organized self-organized, supported by many organizations. They were inputting material. Other groups were inputting material. Any material which was inputted by any group would go on the screen, actually in the negotiating room. You could have got up and write this line and it went on the screen and has to be actually negotiated down uh, and struck out, but that would be on the screen. So it's a hugely consultative two-year process of developing a document, which finally, as you would all agree, has turned up rather well and given us a lot of support for the kind of things we are doing. Uh, so yes, I think it should be a rather elaborate consultative process and we could be kind of suddenly thrown at all of us. Um, where's the microphone? Can someone pass it to the gentleman? Yeah, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan. Um, and I'm a geek, so um, I'm somewhat perhaps unfamiliar with the situation here, but I I, I've been struggling a little bit um, with the discussion throughout this week, uh, trying to figure out sometimes what people are talking about. And it has occurred to me that part of the problem may be that we're trying to talk about internet governance. And an awful lot, that, you know, that covers an awful lot of ground. It, it, it's a very big topic. And I wonder whether the panel members might have a, a view about how we might divide this space up into more reasonable packets um, you know, somewhat more digestible sort of lumps so that we can talk about different kinds of things. Because, you know, sometimes people seem to be talking about internet governance and what they want to talk about is how the DNS works or how packets flow. And sometimes what they want to talk about is child pornography. And those are very different problems. Um, and, and it seems to me that, um, you know, they, they require different kinds of solutions and they require different sorts of stakeholders be involved in that. And I, I'm just not sure how we how we have meaningful conversations about internet governance at this high level without without dividing it into smaller groups and then engaging the relevant people. Yes, uh, so that is a very long um, a problem that we've had for a very long time where internet governance to some people means names and numbers and to other people it means something much broader. The working group on internet governance that reported to the World Summit um, was responsible for supposedly settling that question um, in favour of a broader definition, but um, the confusion still reigns. Does someone want to talk to that on the panel? I'll just make the observation that one of the interesting things that happens at the IGF is the way that gets sorted out is many of these different pieces of it are addressed. We happen to be at a session that's talking kind of about the process structure. Uh, but you can look on the agenda, you know, there's a whole bunch of sessions about child safety, there's a whole other bunch of sessions about big data, a whole other bunch of sessions about, you know, freedom of expression, there's other sessions about, you know, naming, and, and one of the things that kind of is a phenomenon when you come here is you can go for the whole five days and be here, and there's some people you just never lay, lay eyes on because they're kind of on a different track. So 
in some ways, I think the process by design was meant to self-organize that way and not decide for other people what is or isn't in the boat. And if you, uh, there is a, a pretty elaborate multi-stakeholder process that decides what's on the agenda where, you know, anyone can make a proposal and then the MAG works through the proposals and, you know, it, it some, seems sometimes pretty process heavy, but I think the, uh, it, it's a way to deal with that very issue that you raise. And I, I don't hear many complaints about ultimately what isn't isn't allowed. I, I, there is much adjustment that has to go on and we try to make room for everything. But And, and I think maybe someone who is on the IGF Improvement um, Committee, I don't know if Parminder works, has some additional insight on how we've tried to, to sort that out. Uh, one, the, in our view, in my view, the importance and also the, the beauty of working in a multi-stakeholder environment is that each party, each stakeholder can come up with its strengths and its expertise and exercise their roles and responsibility in an informed way, in a way that is taking into account what is being done by others. In that sense, I, I fully agree with you that sometimes it's quite confusing to understand uh, and, and uh, sometimes it's even maybe uh, when we hear some statements on internet governance, it's rather confusing to see to each part of the discussions relating. Uh, according to what it said, uh, it clearly indicates uh, that it refers to this dilemma, icon, ITU, name, uh, critical resources, and in other contexts, something larger. Uh, I think the beauty of the exercise we are engaging in enhanced cooperation is exactly try to come up with some way to, first of all, to, to have a better understanding of what is there, uh, to have a mapping of, of what is there, and on the basis of this, to devise ways in which cooperation could be further improved within the existing institutions, processes, for us. Uh, how can we work with what we have to, to improve, but also to identify existing gaps or something that might be. It's a very complex exercise because it deals with so many different things at the same time. Because the internet today is this overwhelming uh, mechanism that deals with every, each and every aspect of life. So uh, I think it's maybe it's, to start the, the discussion we must delimitate the, the, the scope and, and maybe focus on some particular aspects before moving on. But I think the, the enhanced cooperation exercise will provide us with tools at least to initiate this in a more informed way. But building on extensive uh, work that has uh, been done, things that were done in the past, so I, I think we are building on something that is already there. We are not working in a point, of course, but we are, I think the new environment in which we live from our perspective, is providing much more legitimacy for each stakeholder to accept each other for, for mutual recognition, mutual acceptance, and uh, we, we wish this <laughs> will be the, the final outcome. And on the basis of this, to work, uh, to have a very sober look at what we have, but also a look that will not impede us to make any decisions that are required to make the, the, the system work better. We think we would lose an opportunity if we just engage in a bureaucratic exercise, something that will be sorted in itself, that we are not bold enough or creative enough to, to find new ways. And I think the, what, what we are proposing to do is, is more or less in that direction. We want to come up with some ideas that can be injected in, in, in the process and, and make it work better. So the, uh, it has been asked in this panel, is Internet governance broken? No, it's not. Uh, we are, fortunately it's not, but can it be improved and adjusted certainly from our point of view in, in many aspects. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, Geek's desire for efficient uh, taxonomies and classifications and actually that is a problem. And as for broken also, I know there are different areas. A geek in I can say it wouldn't, it isn't broken, but somebody's emails being read globally that guy would say it is broken, so it's a very difficult decision to arise, uh, 
to arrive at whether it's broken or not. But on, on classifications, I think uh, we, there is an effort, and I agree we need to go in categories, otherwise nothing would move. The Tunis agenda itself categorizes one part, which says day-to-day -day operations, technical operations, are outside the enhanced corporation. So let's, one part was kept out, which is actually functioning of RIRs and most of ICANN and CCTLDs. That was cut out, and it has requirements. It is also internet governance. It has requirements, but it was cut out of enhanced corporation. Now, what has the working group on enhanced corporation done in its last meeting in uh, June, I think, first week of June, is to do another classification. It separated the public policy issues which are pertaining to those day-to-day -day technical functions from general public policy issues which pertain to social, economic, privacy, uh, you know, economic competition, etc. And they have separated two parts. And we agree each of them have different requirements and first separations are important. So that's happening. And, and when you say they have to be dealt separately, there is also a challenge. There is some commonness because all of them are internet. So it's not really, uh, you know, trade and climate change. I mean, though they are related, but they are not that different. So we need a convergent mechanism which deals with the internet-related aspects of security, trade, intellectual property, and develop some frameworks and then hand it over to the concerned organization. Because when we look at a security issue, it has an IP issue. It has a technical issue as well. It could have a trade issue. And if we allow just the specialized organizations to deal with it, they would actually not do a very good work about it because they would bring a traditional, you know, ITU would bring telecom thinking, IP would think about IP and, you know, so you need a convergent mechanism but kind of an interactive uh, um, uh, relationship with the specialized work and that kind of architecture would be proper. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, at the back. Uh, can someone pass over the microphone? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marcin Kasuski. I'm from the Polish of administration digitization. Thank you for the great panel. It was very informative, and especially uh, hearing the different views about Wicked, uh, uh, to which I participated as well. It was very enlightening, uh, because we all have different opinions about that, and it was uh, very enlightening to hear different opinions. Uh, but uh, coming back to, to the issue, so I would like to ask the question concerning how to, uh, because we are all discussing how to make multi-stakeholders uh, uh, more multi-stakeholders, so involving more actors. And uh, often I hear arguments that basically uh, there are a lot of organizations that are participating in, uh, in, in, in various forums, but mostly these organizations are Western-based. And uh, what we hear, at least in Poland, is, uh, and for example, in preparatory process for WICKET, uh, that these organizations that we have uh, in Poland, they cannot really travel and, and, and be uh, active participants of the whole process because of lack of resources. And of course, uh, and uh, on top of that, uh, and some of the colleagues already de discussed that uh, since the internet governance is such a complicated issue, that it includes uh, privacy, cybersecurity, uh, IP, uh, questions, etc., etc. So it's even more difficult to follow different streams and different organizations and different works. So the question would be, how, what do you think about how uh, member states or various organizations like IGF can address this issue? One, I'm uh, trying to ask, uh, answer myself to this question would be, uh, to one, quite one possibility would be to provide more virtual participation uh, solutions, but I don't know how successful these are, how many people are actually following these debates. Uh, and second one would be maybe to, by encouraging member states to really to embrace multi-stakeholderism and try to feed in the, uh, this process from the national point of view. Because uh, as we know, it's all very nice to, to, be, to come here to Bali and, and, and discuss, but I, can, I, I guess we are all kind of privileged to be here. But uh, I guess the majority of, 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 of stakeholders are, are not really present at the discussion. Thank you very much. There, there are other sessions that have been specifically talking about how to um, improve the uh, way that national and regional IGFs can um, act as 
inputs into the global IGF. Um, but maybe some of the panelists here have particular comments. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree. Also, I'll say one thing that we do is we work with organizations that try to grow civil society, particularly in the countries where uh, that needs to be grown. So, so part of it is about bringing the folks who are poised to come, come, trying to figure out a way to, to attack that, and, and the regional IGFs, and the, you know, everyone who's coming should have an open multi-stakeholder process behind them when, before they even get here. But uh, one of the things we also do is work with organizations like Freedom House that both is growing civil society in countries where that needs a boost and then bringing a delegation here. So, you know, it's a very long tail to making this work and, and you have to do all of those things including really support the growth of civil society in countries that, you know, even that is new. Thank you. Uh, yes, in relation to this, I was very glad when I heard the statement that was issued in, in, in regard to the summit we intend to do in Brazil, and we can fully agree with the term there. But one thing that exactly uh, concerned me is there is the call for the participation to be guaranteed and resourced, which is something that entails uh, uh, something that would go be far beyond what the, the kind of support we could provide. But I, I just wanted to refer to a very positive experience we have in Brazil, working within the Brazilian Steering Committee. The Brazilian Steering Committee that is responsible for management of .br, uh, one of its most important, I would say, uh, activities relating to providing support to multi stakeholders is to provide assistance for members that represent different sectors to come to those meetings. Uh, as you see, uh, even in IGF, there are a number of uh, very representative groups coming from the Brazilian. So this is a way maybe to use uh, to, to that government and stakeholders together can enhance the cooperation in such meetings by working together with multi-stakeholder institutions that are dealing with internet also relying for other sources, but uh, our experience is very positive in that regard. Thank you. thank you very much, and that is all we have time for. Uh, so thank you very much, and let's join with me in giving a hand to the panelists.